Well, it is good to be with you. As you can see, some of us you see around at 11 o'clock from time to time, but a lot of our 11 o'clock regulars are doing spring break. They're with their families. And so we're really happy to be able to be with you this morning um, to unpack the word of God, as it were, not just for you, but for us as well. We're in this state of mutual learning. And so when you come, when you show up online, when you are present to worship, what it is is that we get to go deeper into the word and see what is it that God is saying to us today. You know, if you've been tuning in at all, that we're in a sermon series. It's called Covenant, Sacred Promises. And then what we're doing is each Sunday in both services, we're looking at the baptismal covenant and we are looking at the promises um, and tying each of those promises to one of the weeks. And so today is the fourth promise And the question that we hear in the baptismal covenant is, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And that's what we're going to go into deeper today. And I encourage you, um, you may not have tuned into the nine o'clock service. Some of you may have. Listen to both sermons. I know we're busy. But if you have a moment, listen to both sermons and hear the reflections off each other. Their their core is connected, but they're different witnesses. And so I commend that to you to be able to listen to both sermons. So let me just tell you right now what I'm going to say today. In case you go to your grocery list or you start thinking about your kid's school, whatever it is that's on your mind, let me tell you what I'm going to say today. I'm going to say, first of all, that we can only make a promise to God because God has made a promise to us. That is a really important concept, and we give it lip service. But until we understand that any faithfulness we muster comes from the faithfulness of God, we're actually going to be off track. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. This Lent, therefore, the second thing I'm going to say is that I'm spending more time looking at God and Jesus Christ and actually less time looking at my behavior and my Lenten practices. I'll talk about that a little bit. And then third, I will talk about loving, uh, seeking and serving Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors ourselves, but I'm going to do something really strange. I'm going to expand the definition of neighbor because sometimes I think we get so human centric. We hear the words, we kind of assume we know what it means. I'm going to break it wide open and I'm going to replace persons with creation. What would it look like to seek and serve Christ in the whole creation, including the earth, and then have that come back to our relationships with one another? So that's what we're going to do today, okay? So let me talk a little bit about a reorientation that I've done for Lent this year. Um, It's not uncommon in churches or, you know, pastors you've heard before to put a lot of emphasis on what are you going to do, right? What are you not going to do? What are you going to give up? What discipline are you going to take on? And before long, I know we don't mean to do this, but before long in the church, you have this sense that our salvation absolutely depends on what we do or do not do. Now, our actions matter. I'm going to say a caveat. How we live our life certainly makes a difference, but I actually want to clear the table. And I want to say that if we don't begin from the place that God called us into being through creation, made us out of the dust of the earth, made us for faithfulness, made us for relationship, then what we begin to realize is this journey we're on towards Easter is not some brand new thing. It is the way God made us. It is the way we are created. God has given us a fundamental capacity to love and to be loved. It's wired in creation. And so this whole Jesus thing, this whole cross thing, this whole resurrection thing is to restore us to what God has already done in creation. And so for Lent, what I've begun doing is saying, you know, I want to spend a lot more time reading about Jesus, listening to his words, watching what he does, than frankly, what I do or don't do in Lent. Because here's my theory. My theory is if our focus is right, if our eyes are on God, 
then what happens, it's like the, the train, the engine, right? It gets going and all the cars just follow that engine on the track wherever it's gonna go. So what I wanna do is I wanna put my focus on that engine, on God, on what Christ has done and trust that my little cars and caboose are gonna follow. And I encourage you to think about that in your own life. It's not that your disciplines don't matter. Yes, we want you to um, set up your home altars, as we've said. Yes, we want you to read the meditations with your family. Yes, we want you to collect the things into the basket for Austin Street. Those are ways that we remind ourselves that we're on a journey. But if we are doing that thinking that that is going to make us whole, that that is going to justify us before God, it won't. It won't. It'll fall flat. And so what I want you to do is as you're doing those actions, as you're coming to worship, as you're doing those good disciplines, I want you to put front and center before you who God is and what God has done in Christ and meditate on that. There's a corollary in our church right now. We are in a process of getting super clear about our core focus. And we're, get, we're in a process where we're getting super clear about our core values, because what we believe is, if we know what our focus is, which is building Christian disciples for a transformed community, and if we know what our values are, which is collaborative, loyal, kind, growth-oriented, right? If we know those things, then all the doings we do will be on track. So that's, that's what I call you to this Lent. That's what I encourage you to try on. And I think what you'll find is it's a lot more fun, it's a lot more liberating, and that there's joy in this process. We are not trying to suffer in Lent. We are trying to unlock this potential that God has made us in and to create a space, if you were, for that original imago dei, that image of God to shine forth. And we'll do that when we read the Bible, when we see what Christ has done. Now, lest you think I'm just making this up and thinking this is a good idea, let's go to our scripture for today. Let's look at the epistle passage, Ephesians. It's crystal clear here that in a sense, we're justified by what? By God, not by works. It is grace that precedes us. I had an email this week. Um, we're in the pandemic, right? We're separated. We're not able to see each other often, but I get the best emails. And I had a parishioner who I know, it was almost like the Pharisees, you know, setting me up. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail this test. The question was, What's more important, faith or works? Now, I think he knew the answer, but he'd read the passages for this Sunday and he wanted to begin a conversation with me. And his point was, they're both super important. And if you throw out one, you know, you, it's okay to have both of them in tension. And so my answer to his question, is it, is it uh, faith or works? My answer was yes. It was yes. It's what I said before, that God precedes us but our lives matter, our actions matter. And I suggest to you that if you are focusing on the love of God and on what Christ has done, your body can't help but live that out. Your actions, your words, the way you relate with your families, all of that will follow if you understand that you've been given a gracious gift. So I love that email and I loved my answer that it's yes. Listen to Ephesians. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And I want you to pay a special attention to that last sentence because it gets to what I was trying to say before about how we are hardwired at creation to do this. For we are what he has made us. And I suggest not just in our resurrected life in Christ, but what God has made us in creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. We believe that everything came into being through Christ. Whether you believe evolution, whether you believe in uh, seven days of creation, the fact is, it is that eternal word, the logos of God, by which the whole creation was made. And so here it says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, meaning that's going to come naturally, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So what I want you to do is relax into who you are in all of your specificity. Know your humanity. Know your quirks. These are not things you have to shake off. This is how you're made. 
And the question is, how will God's love and faithfulness shine through this incredibly unique person that you are? We'll talk more about that in a minute. Or look at John 3, 16 and 17. We all know John 3, 16. If you don't, just watch the baseball games and look at the guy with the poster behind the catcher. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Now, I grew up in a fundamentalist church, which actually was incredible loving. I'm so grateful for that church background. But there were ways that this verse was used inappropriately. It was this sense that if you are not careful, if you mess up, if you don't believe in Jesus enough, you're going to be lost. That is not the spirit of this passage because verse 17 goes on. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come to condemn us. It's a radical notion. Jesus came to free us to who we are, to who we're made to be. Jesus came to love us. Jesus came to show us who God is, all of those things. And so in his death and in his resurrection, when we look at that engine of the train, we realize what intimacy with God looks like. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came to show us what intimacy with God can look like. And so I love these verses from John 16 and 17. Yes, he loved the world, but it was so that we might be freed to our essential selves. So our scripture lessons for today seem to suggest that this salvation, this walk of faith is not something we fundamentally do. It's a response to what God has done, and we need to remember that. So now I want to look at this promise that we make in the baptismal covenant. And it's number four, and it says, Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Chris talked about this this morning, and he made some really good points about how that sounds easy enough, right? It kind of sounds like we'll just be nice. It's really hard. It's really hard, especially for the ones who have hurt us, the ones who have betrayed us, the ones who have ignored us. Right? Those are the ones we're being called to love. And so you have, I'm sure, been on this journey for a while. And so I'm not going to presume to tell you about what it means to love your neighbor. It's a good reminder that we need to love one another. But I want to open this up today. And I absolutely admit it's because of an experience I had a week ago in my garden, which broke me open. And Mary and Greg are just going to laugh because we have this thing during the week where we check in what's a personal best, what's a business best. And I've just been saying in every meeting, my personal best is the garden that I planted a week ago. Now, some of you are green thumbs. You are real gardeners. You know what you're doing. I have no idea what I'm doing in the garden, okay? I have a townhouse in Uptown, and I have a tiny postage stamp of land in front of my house, and I have a massive mag magnolia tree in that spot, right? I mean, they're lovely. I love magnolia trees. It is deadly to anything that wants to grow. Those of you who are gardeners know this. You need special kind of plants that can grow under the magnolia tree. And so I began to research and think, well, what, what can do well in shade? And I began this process of Googling and talking to the poor people at the nursery. I'm sure they had better things to do. But I basically assembled a sense of what might grow in that space. And it was a very small uh, set of plants. And what I found is, first of all, although I walk regularly, I'm active, I do some yoga, my body was not prepared for the hard work of the garden. I mean, I obviously, you know, I should have had pads on or something, but I was bent over and I was fighting clay and roots and occasional rocks. I was spent. And that is actually the first thing I want to take away from this garden experience and the life of faith is that we need to engage our bodies. We need it to be the whole person, not just our minds, not just our spirits, but our bodies. That God, in a sense, came to us in the body, in Jesus Christ incarnate. And so as I fought with that ground, not only was I sore beyond belief, but I was very much in my body. It was like a labor of love. So that was one thing. The second was, as I looked at the plants, I realized they were very different and I needed to get to know each one. So first in the front of the garden is what's called dead nettle. Some of you know it's a ground cover. 
And it's great. It grows fast. It's robust, but it can also take over. And so what I've got to do is I've got to keep my eye on the dead nettle so it doesn't just kind of do this. That's a very specific attribute of that plant. And then there's the gardenia bushes. I don't know why I chose gardenias, but they, have, they need special soil. They like it a little bit acidic. But if you care for them, they will put out flowers that are the best smelling things you've ever smelled. And so I can't wait for my little gardenia bushes to begin to have these white flowers and to have that fragrant smell. Plum pudding coral bells. That's a tongue twister. Plum pudding coral bells are those little purple plants that are very spindly. They look like they'll just be crushed in an instant, but what they do is they grow and they gather together and they clump. And then you have these balls of purple beauty, right? That's what I'm hoping happens. But right now they're just so fragile. They stand alone by themselves. And then Texas purple sage. I don't know if you have this in your garden or if you've heard of this. This is native to our area and it's like a nuclear blast could happen. And Texas purple sage will just keep on growing. And what happened this week or a few weeks ago when it was so cold and the leaves had all died, all you saw were these spindly branches. And I was like, surely that, because I had planted those a year before, surely that has killed them. And I come out, I've been watering this new garden. I've been putting the little soaker hoses that purple sage, that bright green leaves, they're just bursting out all over that plant. The reason I spend some time talking about this for two reasons. One is that we are as unique and precious as those plants and flowers. We are not, we do not love one another generally. We do not love one, or one another generically. We love one another specifically. Mary is a particular person and I seek through Christ to love her as Mary. Greg and Warren and each of you, you are your own creation. And part of it is we get to know one another. We pay attention so that, you know, the water, the soil, the sun, the, the shade is the right amount so that that special unique being can flourish. And so when we talk about loving our neighbor as ourselves, what I wonder is, is if we could break that open and imagine the whole creation as an expression of Christ's love for us. And if we could see the ways that we impact the environment and the environment impacts us, this isn't a political speech. This is Genesis. God made us stewards of creation. God made us, called us to tend the earth, to name the creatures in love, not to dominate it, not to exploit it, not to use it up but to love it and tend it and steward it. And so if we can do this with the earth, if we can begin to see the beauty and the variety that's around us, what I wonder is, is if when we come back to our relationships, we'll have a new profound awareness for human creatures. You know, we are a part of creation. And I'm really curious about how our engagement with the earth will actually enable us to love one another better. So yes, hear this promise as persons, but allow it to go beyond the human race into the living creation and then back again and see one another, just like these plants in my garden, see one another as unique and specific and requiring a certain kind of love. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite poets says this, one of the most important resources that a garden makes available for us is the gardener's own body. A garden gives the body the dignity of working in its support. It is a way of rejoining the human race. Do you see what he's saying? We go into our gardens, we work on the earth so that we can actually return to the human race transformed. And that's, that's the image I'd like you to take away today. So what have we talked about? We've talked about that our theme is covenant, making sacred promises and understanding we can't make those on our own. We need God to make them in us. And then we respond to that faithfulness of God. We've talked about what it means to love your neighbor, not only your human neighbor, but your creation neighbor and how that then equips us for life together. And I think the essence of what I'm trying to say, what's at the bottom of all this is sacramental living, sacred living, that everything sings of the glory of God. We know that this altar is a sacrament, that it points to God. We know that baptism is a sacrament that joins us with Christ. 
but your whole life is sacramental, right? Um, Wendell Berry again said this quote, there are no unsacred places, there are only sacred places and desecrated places. Let me read that again. There are no unsacred places, there are only sacred places and desecrated places. So I think our call in Christ is to make sacred all things. Those places that have been desecrated, those places in our lives, in our relationship, in our culture, in our city, there are places that have become desecrated and we are called in Christ to go out and remind and reveal the sacredness of those places. Sacramental living aligns us with God's intention for creation, God's intention for relationship, and it leads us to that kind of human flourishing that was always imagined from the beginning. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that in wisdom you made us in your image. And the whole of human history is about reminding us of who we are made to be in you. And so we keep our eyes focused on you, on the love of your son, and we ask that you will transform us so that places that have been desecrated can be made, sac could be, can be made sacred in your name. Amen.